Today in the studio, I got a real treat for you folks. Sean Michael Crane, what's cracking? What's up, Brad? Dude, if you guys haven't heard of this dude, then you need to go check out his website, SeanMichaelCrane.com. You can find him on social media at Sean underscore Michael underscore Crane, C-R-A-N-E dot com. You want to get up on that sucker. Dot com. I mean, I'm sorry. Sean underscore Michael underscore Crane. And then obviously Facebook's Sean Michael Crane. So, dude, ultimately, your story is basically jailhouse to the penthouse, yeah? That's what's happening. So what'd you go to jail for? So I was arrested and charged with attempted murder. Who'd you try to murder? I didn't try to. (laughs) Allegedly. So I'll give you the story, man. It's something out of a book, something out of a movie, right? Um, Give you a little backdrop. Growing up in Santa Barbara, California, I don't know if you've been there. No, I haven't. I got to check it out. It's beautiful, though. It's beautiful. Uh, People come from all over the world to check it out. I had the privilege of growing up there, but I didn't take advantage of that. You know, I had big dreams as a kid. I wanted to be a professional athlete. Uh, I had, you know, baseball. I love surfing, too. So, Whatever one I chose, I could have went pro. I I was giving my all, and I was loving life as a kid. And then at 14, my dad went to prison. My mom left us all within my first month of freshman year in high school. What did your dad go to prison for? He had a pistol. He had a gun. There was an argument at the house. The cops came. So Brandon Sheen, a weapon. You don't don't go to prison for that. Yeah, you do in California. You go to prison? Yeah. Like, Like how long? For 16 months. Damn, dude. Yeah. That's heavy duty. Yeah. So I went from living this innocent life thinking things were great and I I had a great future ahead of me to realizing, no, there was a big problem in my household. My parents were battling addiction. There was all this turmoil and chaos that I never really saw or understood. And it all just came to the forefront on that day. So in the blink of an eye, my dad's gone, my mom's gone, and we're living at the same house with my uncle. And I'm trying to- Where'd your mom go? She was strung out. She was battling addiction my whole life and I didn't really know. And when my dad left, she just came unraveled and sh- like slowly, but surely she started not coming home, not coming home. And we weren't seeing her and she was just gone. Now this book prison of your own that you wrote, is that about all that? Yeah. Yeah. It talks about the stuff I went through in childhood, a lot like what you describe as far as the trauma, the things that we have within us that we can't resolve. I was dealing with all that early on. So I didn't know what was going on in my life until I sat in a cell and was able to reflect and I could see the truth. I could, you know, connect the dots to why I ended up in that cell. Yeah, I didn't do the crime, and we'll talk about that in a second, but this was 10, 15 years in the making of choices and going down that path. And I had to go back and relive a lot of the things that I dealt with or suppressed from early on in my childhood, the things I didn't want to talk about. You know, my parents leaving me. My dad and my mom are doing drugs in the other room. You know, a broken home. All these things that made me feel ashamed of who I was. What kind of drugs? Heroin and alcohol mainly. Damn. Yeah. Heroin's the heavy duty. Yeah, man. It kills people, right? And they were just using it, you know, to to get by. They weren't abusing it to the point where you could tell, you know, and they weren't passed out on the couch every day. They were up and doing things and working, but they had a habit, you know, and they were slowly succumbing to that addiction. How are they doing now? They're both gone. The past? Yeah, I lost my dad last year, almost a year ago. It was his birthday yesterday, and then I lost my mom while I was incarcerated. And and that's a bummer to hear, uh, but it's part of your story. Yeah. It's part of what, you know, made you who you are. So your goal is like, not goal, but, you know, you're speaking, you do, you know, a couple of TEDx talks, your story's moving people. Uh, your goal would be what? To be a public speaker, like, like full-time Tony Robbins type or what, what do you, what do you end up wanting to be? Yeah. I want to hit those big stages. I love speaking. I had the privilege of speaking last week at a business event uh, in Arlington, Texas. And I just feel like that's my element. You know, I love to be able to share my story in a way that other people can receive and then share the strategies that helped me to change my life. And so they can implement them right now in their life as well. Did anyone teach it this or you just, you just, uh, naturally getting up there and doing it. So in prison, I was in a drug program. In the first week or so, they have you get up on the podium, kind of like this, and tell your story. And I'll never forget the first time I got up there, my face turned red, my voice was quivering, my palms were sweating, and I couldn't really speak. And I didn't like that feeling. I went back down and sat down with the other guys, and they were clowning me. Man, what happened? Why is your face red? In that moment, I took that as a challenge because I didn't like 
the fact that I wasn't in control of myself. I couldn't control my emotions. I couldn't control myself in that moment. And so I started speaking more in the drug program. I started just trying to, to focus on bettering myself through reading and writing. And that naturally came out when I was speaking as well. And then another prison I went to, they actually had Toastmasters. Have you heard of Toastmasters? Sure. So I started participating in Toastmasters and I couldn't believe see, the first day I went, I saw another inmate give a speech and it was amazing. I mean, he had this powerful message. He captivated the audience. He didn't, he didn't budge or break during his speech and his presentation. And I thought, man, I want to do that. I want to be able to do that and share my story, my message. So I started participating in Toastmasters and I started giving rehearsed speeches. They were only about five to six minutes, but it was practice and I was getting better at it. And then when I came home, just using social media to share my message, share my story and you practicing all the time, practicing at home, knowing that that was the vision. That's what I want to do. And then finally getting an opportunity earlier this year to do a Ted talk and then to speak at the badass business summit last weekend. Now, when, when all this stuff happened, you were what, 23? Yeah, I was 23. And you're sitting in jail for attempted murder. Yeah. And then I said, Who, who'd you murder or who'd you try to murder? Or allegedly. And, allegedly. And you yeah. said, you didn't really do it. Uh, who was it? Like, so, why, would, why, who, why would they arrest you for attempted murder if you didn't attempt to murder someone? Crazy, right? Uh, so I went to a party on the Mesa in Santa Barbara, which is right on the cliffs on the beach. It's beautiful. I wasn't even going to go to that party. I was going to go downtown, hang out with some friends, but we got invited to it. And I didn't know anyone there. I went with a childhood friend that I knew from kindergarten and we show up and we, we don't know anybody. We're just hanging out, drinking. And this girl that I knew from the past shows up with three other guys. And I knew of them. I had seen them before. We might've talked one or two times, but we never hung out outside of that party. But they're the only people that I really knew, you know, or was associated with. So we're hanging out, drinking and, they had got into an altercation with some guys at the party I'd never seen before. They almost got in a fight and then it died down. And so we're hanging out the rest of the night and we go to leave. We go to leave to go downtown to the bars where we we're supposed to be. And that group of guys follows us out. And now there's a confrontation in the front yard and you could tell there's going to be a fight going down. I'm just sitting there. I'm prepared to see this fight and see what happens. And it breaks, it breaks out. All hell breaks loose. People are throwing punches. It's like a melee on the front lawn. People are flying everywhere. And I see this guy standing across from me from where you're at. And he locks eyes with me and starts walking towards me. And as he does, I just get blindsided. I feel like I'm getting tackled or jumped or something. And I get slammed into a parked car. And then I fall to the ground. And I got this person on top of me. I'm bear hugging, trying to just hold on. I'm, I'm thinking any minute I'm going to start getting kicked in the head and jumped. And they're attacking me for some reason. But that doesn't happen, and I'm just trying to roll this guy off of me. And finally, I roll him off of me, and as I get up, my thought was this guy is going to swing on me. He's here to attack me. He's going to hurt me. So I threw two punches towards him, and they glanced off the side of his head. And then I stood up, and he stayed face down, <coughs> and he didn't move. Mm. And I hear my friend calling me, my childhood friend, Sean, let's go, Sean, let's go. And he's standing in the street about 10 feet away, and everyone's screaming. It's crazy, and we're just trying to get out of there at this point. And I start limping over towards him. My back got all messed up in that crash into the car. And when I get under the street light, just like this, there's just blood dripping all off of me. I mean, covering my face, my, my chest, my arms. And he looks at me in the eyes and he goes, man, what the hell? You're covered in blood, Sean. And I'll never forget that moment. It was so surreal. And we, we get out of there. We walk up the street. He had called a cab because we were supposed to leave. And as we're walking up around the corner, Cops are run, um, coming by with their sirens on. They're racing to the party. And we duck into this little laundry mat. And I was so drunk and, and altered at that point, I could barely function. And he's just kind of guiding me. He pulls out an old shirt from the laundry mat dryer. He's like, you can't walk around like that. Here, throw, throw this on. So I take off my bloody shirt and I put on that shirt. And, and we walk away and we get in the cab and we leave. And by the time I got to his place that night, I knew something bad had happened. I was trying to make sense of... What, what just took place right there? You know, it happened so quickly. And sure enough, I Googled it the next morning when I woke up and it said two men were stabbed at a party on the Mesa. One's in critical condition. They don't think he's going to make it. And then later that day, I was arrested. For, for the stabber? Yeah. So what happened is no one saw the initial attack. Everyone came out of the party as it was already taking place. What everyone said in the police report was we saw Sean getting up off of the guy, throwing two punches down at him. And the way the cops wrote it up was that I was striking. That's the word they used. So that could be a punch, uh, a weapon. 
And I was just trying to defend myself at that point. I didn't even really hit him, but I threw those two punches and that's what everyone saw. So now the cops are looking for me. They find a bloody shirt, my shirt. They, people at the party are saying that they saw me on top of this guy and I was, was he already him. stabbed by then. Yeah. So I, th- what I, what I know that happened after talking to other people and playing it back in my head was that when they were tackling him and stabbing him into me, that was that crash into the car and then onto the ground. By the time he was on top of me, he was already stabbed and he was just bleeding on top of me. So you must've went to court and f- lost. So the first day I went to court, my lawyer came up to me and she looked at me and she was scared. She was all nervous. She said, Hey, the victim's brain dead. He's not going to make it. They're going to uh, amend your charges to homicide. You're going to be charged with homicide formally today. And that was the first thing I heard at court. And so they didn't do it that day. They said, well, let's wait and see what happens. He was in a coma. Allegedly he died three times on the way to the hospital and they revived him and he was in a coma and they were saying he was brain dead. He wasn't going to make it. And the paparazzi, you know, the paparazzi, the news press was there taking pictures of me. My picture was on the front page of the newspaper in my hometown for this attempted murder. And so I go back to jail, to my cell, and I'm thinking my life's over. At 23, I'm thinking they're going to send me to prison for the rest of my life, and it's done. And I end up fighting that case for eight months, going back and forth to court. The victim survived, thank God. He knew and his family knew I didn't do it. But no, and a lot of people knew I didn't do it, but no one wanted to come and talk to the cops. No one wanted to come forward and get involved. But so in court, when they said, dude, you're guilty, how come the dude didn't say that guy didn't stab me? He didn't want to come and talk to the cops. He didn't want to get involved. He didn't ask for any restitution. He didn't ask for anything. He just wanted to be removed from the situation. Uh, he almost needs an ass kicking for that. I mean, part, part, part of me would think, man, why isn't this guy come? I thought I was going to get let go. I yeah, thought they I'd were going like, to come and say, hey, you know, so-and-so came in and talked to the DA or the judge. Um, you're out of here. We're going to, you know, do your paperwork and let you go. And so for the first couple months, that was my hope. I'm just waiting. Like, this can't be real. This can't be happening. And then three months goes by, and I'm going back to court four months. And then I'll, I'll never forget one day I called my lawyer. And he goes, well, you're going to prison, Sean. They think you did it. No one's saying anything otherwise. The police report looks really bad. You're going to prison. It's just, a ma- it's a matter of how long at this point. Hmm. Man, it, it's easy to sit back and, you know, listen, because I'd be like, dude, you got a, you got a shitty attorney. Like, something's wrong. Like, if I didn't stab anybody, I'm not going anywhere. But, dude, that's not always true. You can get, you can get easily convicted of something you didn't do. It happens all the time. It happens yeah. more than people think. Yeah. And I mean, who knows if I would have had, you know, a hundred grand to drop on a lawyer and drag it out for a couple of years and, and fight it would more information have come out maybe, but you know, that wasn't my fate. That wasn't what was supposed to happen. So you ended up, you ended up getting sentenced to the pokey where, where? So I, I took a plea deal. I didn't go to trial. They told me if I go to trial, federal or state state. So I took a plea deal. They dropped my charge to assault with a deadly weapon. I had to admit to doing something I didn't do. And then I got, I got seven years mm. at 85%. You have to do 85% of your sentence. So I did five and a half years. Uh, first spot you go is Wasco, which is a reception. They send you there and figure out what prison you're going to do your time at, which is up in Bakersfield, California. It's just in the middle of nowhere, and it's not a fun place to be. You know, that was my first experience in prison. So you wake up, you're in prison. Yeah. Tell me about that. I mean, it's it's surreal. You know, it had been almost a year by this point, so... I had already started to change my life. I'd already just started. I made a commitment to myself in the county jail on about month four. As I I was fighting my case, I knew it wasn't going away. My whole life, Brad, I ran from my problems, man. I took pills. I drank. I, 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 you know, I suppressed my emotions. I didn't talk about my parents. I've been running from my problems my whole life. And by the time I got to that cell, I was exhausted. I was exhausted from running, feeling defeated, losing. You know, and I didn't feel in my heart that I was a loser. I knew I was made for more, but I wasn't giving my all. I wasn't showing the world my true self. And I'll never forget in that cell, I just made a commitment that no matter where I go, how much time I spend in prison, I'm going to give my all to be in my best self for the rest of my life. And so that included sobriety. That included, you know, being true and, and authentic to who I am. And I never looked back from that moment. You know, there was one day specifically in court, I was sitting there all day shackled up like this from 6 a.m. till 4 p.m. 
on these stainless steel benches. I was one of the last people to be seen. And I was just in this constant state of reflection. And I was sitting there trying to make sense of what was happening to me. And I was starting to see my part in everything. I wasn't mad at the judge or the DA. I wasn't blaming others. I was starting to, to connect the dots to my drug use and being at that party and not pursuing my dreams and my vision for who I wanted to be and taking the shortcuts in life. And I, I took responsibility for being in that cell. And I started thinking about how I had hid behind drugs and alcohol for so long and how it had led me to living an inferior life. And in that moment, this thought just surfaced within me. You don't ever have to use drugs and alcohol ever again. And it wasn't a question, but it was a definitive statement. At that point, I felt like I needed drugs and alcohol to cope and get by. And in that moment, something changed inside of me. It clicked, and I've never had a craving or an urge or a desire to use drugs or alcohol ever again. That's been nine years since that moment. So from then on, every day, I just focused on bettering myself in that cell. I had nothing. I had some books, writing paper, a little dictionary, and I just started creating these routines in my cell every day. First, it was you know, positive self-talk, um, thinking about the things in my life that I was grateful for and just, you know, fighting that internal battle every day, not allowing the what ifs or the negative um, aspects of my situation to win me over. Cause I would have been dead in that cell. I would have, I would have, you know, felt like I was suffocating every day from the, the negative thoughts and the, you know, the, the what ifs about the future and spending the rest of my life in prison. So I just started establishing this routine and then I would, I would take action every day. I would work out as hard as I could. I would read and I would write. And that was the beginning of my journey of personal development and redemption. And by the time I got to Wasco, I'd been doing this for eight months. So that's, that's where my focus was. I wanted to sharpen myself any way I could every day. And so being in Wasco, it was a new setting, a new prison. There was a lot of adversity, a lot of violence. There was a lot of situations that I encountered, but I still had these daily routines and this mindset that I was creating day by day that helped me to continue moving forward in my life. How important do you think reading and writing is every day? It's life changing. When I got to that cell, I didn't believe in myself. I thought that I was, I lacked intelligence because I didn't really try in high school. I barely graduated. I went to alternative school, took world history for two years to get credits and then went back and went through my ceremony. So I didn't learn anything. And I doubted myself because of this. I just thought, okay, I have street smarts, I'm athletic, but I lack the intellect. And that wasn't true, I just never applied myself. So when I got into my jail cell, my writing was horrible, I couldn't spell, you know, I could read, but I wasn't really absorbing everything I was reading. And I, I looked at that as a, a massive challenge in my life because I didn't like the way it made me feel. So I started writing these letters home and I had a cellmate at the time. And I would ask him, hey, how do you spell this word? Oh, how do you spell that word? And he was helping me at first, but he got fed up with me. And one day I asked him, you know, how do you spell this word? And out of the corner of my eye, a little pocket dictionary hit me in the shoulder. He said, look it up. At first I was kind of pissed, you know, I was like, man, this guy. But, you know, in my head, I said, okay, watch this. And I started looking up all these words as I would read. And I would start writing them down and quizzing myself every week. Like I was back in elementary school. And then I would start using those words in my letters back home or on phone calls, or even when I was conversing with him. What was one of the best words? The best words, there was so many. I mean, what, you know. What was your favorite? Gosh, what's my favorite? Man. Plethora? Plethora, that was a good one. I learned so many words. You know, I felt my mind just expanding rapidly. You know, I'm putting all these words in my letters back home and my family members were probably thinking, what's this guy trying to do? Like, this doesn't even make sense. He's using too many big words in one sentence. But I was so excited that I was seeing the change and that I could do it, that I was capable. My favorite word was probably inexorable meaning like relentless, driven. And that's how I felt in that moment. I probably would use that word three or four times in every letter, you know? And I just started doing this daily and then I was getting books sent in and I was starting to feel my mind expand and change, my speed of thought. And I saw in that moment that I could truly change my life with enough effort. And then forgetting the bombs, there's one right there. That's a fact. You know, a lot of people have been to prison, they wanna use that as a crutch. They wanna get out, no one will hire a felon. Dude, number one, start your own business. Number two, people will hire a felon. Number three, uh, you know, I don't recommend it uh, very much, but don't put your felon. Yeah. <laughs> Did you? I never have filled out one resume in my life. Ever? Never. So, so right now, when you got out, you didn't have to get a job? I did. So I knew what I wanted to do. You know, being in prison, I started changing so much about myself and my life. 
And I knew I was going to come home and be a felon. I didn't want to go back to my old lifestyle. And that included working and doing the same type of jobs I'd done before. My uncle owns a tree service. So I would climb trees with a chainsaw, trim trees, cut trees. It's a great workout. It's a good job. It's a pretty good career. You know, he's done well for himself. But I just associated that with my, my old self. So when I came home, I was staying on his property in a trailer. I got out. I had $200 in my pocket. No material items, nothing. I'm staying on this trailer, and I have nothing. And so I went back and worked with him for two months to get my feet back on the ground and save some money. But every day I was there, I just felt like I was going the wrong way in life. I, f I felt like I knew what I wanted to do. I had uncovered that truth about myself and my, my purpose, which was to work with people and help people. That's what I did in prison. I was able to mentor guys while I was in there. You never got in fights? No, not one fight. Hmm. That's pretty lucky. Well, Did you ever he, see any? Oh, yeah, all the time. My first week in Wasco, the first night I came out for dinner, they pop all the cells, and you step out of your cell, and you got the guard tower, and you have to stand there until they tell you to move, and then you walk and you get chow. And right when I op that my cell door opened up, out of the corner of my eye, I see some guy walking towards me pretty quickly. You're not supposed to move at that moment. Like, there's no movement allowed. And he, he attacked the guy next to me, the cell next to me. They had some prior issue. And so they started fighting, and you hear this loud boom, and the guard tower shot his block gun. But he didn't hit the attacker. He, got, he hit the guy who was getting attacked in the back of the head, and he, he got knocked out. If you get hit in the head with a block gun, it's fatal, you know? And so he didn't move, and we thought he was all dead right there on the spot. And they revived him. He was okay. But that was my first night having chow in prison. Mm. That scare you? That was the world I was in. I expected it, but it always scares you. It catches you off guard because it happens so quickly. Were you, were you working out prior to going to jail? A little bit. Were I had a short you, stint of sobriety. I had good size. I was climbing trees and carrying big old pieces of wood, and I was in good shape. So when you got there, did nobody mess with you ever? No. You just mind your own business? Yeah. Yeah, what I mind my own business, and, you know, I was respectful, and people saw my – my work ethic and my conduct, and they respected my discipline. If I could get up every morning and do a thousand push-ups and squats before they even got up, and then they saw me over there reading my book and, you know, minding my own, and then I was respectful in the chow hall, what are they going to say to me? You know, they're looking for guys that are either victims and, and you know, weak-minded, weak individuals that they could prey on, or people that are putting their two cents out there and they're putting themselves in the game. Now you're intertwined with the politics and what's going on in prison. And your fair game. Yeah, like gamble, trade, commissary, things yeah. like that. Yeah, drugs, gambling. Interesting. So so you were in there a total of how long? Five and a half years. Did that seem like forever? Yeah. But I was so immersed in my daily activities. Like I created a day that allowed me to pour myself into everything I was doing. And I went to bed every night, Brad, feeling accomplished. I went to bed every night feeling the best I ever had in my life. I couldn't believe I was experiencing this in prison. You know, I miss my family. I wanted to just get up and leave and go home. There's a lot that you miss and you battle depression in there. But the way I was feeling about myself and the person I was creating was indescribable. And I just, my number one goal was to continue to cultivate this energy and mentality every day so I could come home and do what I wanted in my life and share it with the world. So every day was an opportunity and I couldn't waste a minute or a, a, a second because I was so scared that suddenly that spark that was ignited inside of me was going to fade away or you know, that mentality was going to fade away. So I had to take perpetual action from the moment I opened my eyes to the moment I went to sleep to build myself up, to continue to breathe life into that person I wanted to be, um, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. And that's what I did every day. I didn't miss a day for 2000 some odd days. Mm. You didn't have a girlfriend before you went in. I did, but we broke up six months before I got in trouble. Damn. So you were single. Which was a good thing. Well, yeah, but you were single. Yeah. Because when you're not, that, that makes it even worse. Oh, I'd see guys, you know, coming back from the phone, hot, tr trying to hide the tears in their eyes, you know, or, you know, we call it hard timing. When your mind's on the street, but your body's incarcerated in prison, all they could think about is what's my girl doing? Who's she with? Why didn't she answer? Why didn't that money hit my books this week? And it tortures them. Yeah. So if someone's heading to jail, give them a tip. Cut your girl off. <laughs> Blow your girl out? She ain't going to be there, man. I mean, very, very few stick around, no matter how solid they are. If you're going away for four or five years, 
I've seen it happen, but more than likely it doesn't. Yeah, I've seen it happen. More than likely it doesn't. I'd agree with that. So, so you're in prison. You're, you're minding your own business. You're working out. You're reading and writing. You're personally developing. And then you get out. Now what? How long ago was this, by the way? It'll be four years in October. Okay, so you just got out four years ago. Then what? So I was staying on my, at my aunt and uncle's property in that small little trailer trying to figure out what's the next step that I need to take to start moving towards this vision I have. My vision was working with people, sharing my message on a, a bigger scale. But I'm, I'm just out. What do I do? What's your message? My message is, is that when I got incarcerated, I wasn't, you know, I was facing a life sentence. And the severity of my situation was so intense that I was thinking about it every day. It was on my mind. But what struck me the most was what I didn't do in my life. And what I mean by that is I was started, I was overcome with regret and remorse for the way I chose to live my life. All I could think about was the wasted opportunities, the life that I could have had that I didn't pursue, you know, the days that I just let pass me by. And this happened because I was scared and I doubted myself and I had allowed fear and my own self doubt to dictate the way I live my life. And I know so many people find themselves stuck inside that same mental prison. They have this life they dream of this person they aspire to be, but they're settling for less because they're scared. What if I can't do it? What will other people think? What if I fail? And they never take the steps to get there. So I could see this as clear as day when I was sitting in my cell. I had done this to myself. You know, I, I had lived a life I didn't want because of my choices and actions. And so being able to change my life in jail, starting with my mindset, my daily actions, and these small little steps I took every day that started to build up my sense of self-worth and my sense of competence. I know anybody could do that, but most people are thinking of this life they want that's way over here. And they're stuck down here. They're like, how am I going to bridge that gap? How am I going to get there? So my message is that if you start with the small daily actions and you start building up your belief in yourself, before you know it, you're going to be a lot closer to that dream or that goal than you realize. But most people just stay stuck and they think about it. They want to do it, but they're not doing it. So that's my message. My message is that you don't know what you're doing to yourself. And when you get to the end of your life, if you don't pursue your dreams and your vision with every ounce of energy you possess you're going to be confronted by a form of regret that will absolutely devastate you. And there's no second chances when you get to the end of your life. I got one. I know what that feels like. I don't want other people to experience that when it's too late. When is it too late? When you die? I mean, how many people do you think are, you know, it, until you die, you still have a chance, but how many people do you think are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s thinking, I wish I would have. I wish I would have pursued that business idea I had. I wish I would have, you know, taken better care of my wife and kids. I wish I would have taken better care of my health. My body's deteriorating. I'm dying 10 years earlier than I should be. All the what ifs or I wish I would have, they start to plague us as we get older. Yeah, well, those what ifs can, can definitely impede your ability to succeed. How do you get rid of the what ifs? Well, you got to believe in yourself, right? How do you build that belief? Small daily actions done to the best of your ability. Incremental wins. When I was in my cell, I had nothing but writing paper, a couple random books, and a small pocket dictionary. I started working out like it was the last day I had arms and legs. I looked up every word in that dictionary more times than I can count because that's all I had. I wanted to be a scholar as well. I wanted to be, you know, a bodybuilder in that cell. I wanted why, to be- Why, why, why? Why? Because my life mattered. And I didn't want to just die in that cell think, with, with nothing to prove or show the world. I knew I was made for more than that. And when I got to that cell and I saw the truth, which was, man, you just wasted your life. You had all these big dreams. You had all these goals. You're going to be a pro surfer, a pro baseball player. You talked about it. Look at you now. You're just going to be another one of those people who had dreams that didn't pursue them. You're just going to be another one of those people that wasted their potential. I hated the way I felt in that cell. I was so ashamed. I was so ashamed. And I took that that negative energy, that emotion, I turned it and used it in my favor and channeled it into everything I was doing. And it, they all had to be positive actions that built me up because I had spent over a decade doing things that just tore me down over and over. Hmm. So when you like woke up and, you know, every single day in prison and you just read, wrote, worked out, no one was messing with you. So it wasn't that tough. What was the hardest thing? for you? I mean, you're hungry. You miss your family. You battle depression. You battle the what ifs about when you get out, are you going to be able to find success, live a good life? Are you going to get out and just go back to drugs, go back to your old lifestyle? I mean, it's the, it's the mental war that you have to battle every day. Now, 
when you were before you went in, were you doing drugs? Yeah. What kind of drugs? Pills, smoking weed, drinking. In Santa Barbara. Yeah. All your friends doing it too? They were, yeah. I had uh, you know, a circle of friends that kept me stuck that I was were, were comfortable you in with. School or did you drop out? I went to high school and I got a degree and after that I went right into work. So or I got my diploma and then I went right into working for my uncle. Yeah, so so when you went to school, like a bunch of drugs? Yeah, every day. The person you supposedly stabbed, that person still walking around today? Yeah. Did they feel bad they didn't say anything now? I've never talked to him. Never talked to him or heard from him. The only thing I heard for, through a family friend was that him and his family knew I didn't do it. That was it. So somebody at that party stabbed. How big was the party? Couldn't be that big. It was big. So three people were arrested. Myself and another individual got charged with a stabbing. The other individual went to prison too. There was another party that wasn't arrested that I got blamed for the assault for. Well, you know, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. That shit happens, dude. Exactly. I'm surprised that, you know, they convicted you of it because unless someone, like, saw you, but maybe they had witnesses that saw what they saw and they put two and two together. And Plus, you pled guilty. You should have fought it. I might still be in prison. You might, but you also I, might but not be But now I'm living the life that I always dreamt of, man. And I don't look back and think I wish I would have or what if, right? Because the way everything's unfolded since and the life that I'm able to live now is everything I wanted and more. So I look back at that as the defining moment of my life. And I felt that in the midst of it. I felt like this is your, sh your shot, man. This is your one chance to, to really just go all in to be the person you want to be. You're never going to get this opportunity again. Maybe that's why it happened to you. That's what I think. I don't question it. I don't look back and try to think what if or if this happened, would my life be different? I look at it as it was exactly what was supposed to take place in my life. And it gave me everything that I have today. It, it gave me a beautiful family, a career that I love doing, big dreams that I'm still chasing. I get to come here and talk to you today. None of this would have been possible. I'd either be dead or living a meager, inferior life if I didn't go to prison and that didn't happen. Yeah, man, that's a pretty good attitude. You know, a lot of times people would use the prison to hold them back from the future. Mm -hmm. So, Sean, let me ask you. So... Again, not everybody goes to prison, but what can people learn even though they don't, they don't have to go to prison? They don't want to go to prison. They're not going to go to prison to just get a more positive mindset on a regular basis. Like, what did you learn to do that? Yeah, two things stand out to me the most. I think a lot of people lack gratitude for what they have. Going to prison teaches you real quick how precious every little thing in your life is. Right. The little things that you overlook every day, you'd be wanting back in your life so badly. So every day, telling yourself that life is happening for you, not to you. Everything that's happening in your life right now is a blessing and a gift if you look at it that way. Even the adversity, even the obstacles, you can learn and grow through those moments more so than anything else. So, so start, say get, let's say you got food poisoning. That's life happening for you? Maybe you need a little rest. Right? I mean, who's, who's, the, who's the... Okay, my wife got food poisoning chemist. recently, so let me try to... Let me try. The way I look at everything, I always find a way to pinpoint the positive or the positive potential, and I pour myself into that. I refuse to sit there and dwell on the negative because it has negative repercussions. It's going to affect my attitude, my actions, maybe the way I'm engaging with people. So even if I got food poisoning and I'm throwing up and then I'm a jerk to my son because I feel like shit, is that okay? No. So you got to reframe the way you look at it. You know, maybe this is going to make me appreciate the good food that I get to eat all the time. Living in America, not having to go out and, you know, kill, kill animals to eat. I don't know. However, you have to reframe it in your mind so that you don't feel like a victim in that moment. What if someone kicked in your door and raped your wife and then killed her? Damn, Brad, this is the real stuff right here. Well, I mean, dude, like, because I'm, yeah. I'm trying to vet out the, the statement, life happens for well, you. Well, it's a cliche statement. You. Well, because again, I mean, I don't, I've never bought that statement. I still don't. Life happens for you. I think just life happens. Yeah. Period. Well, you, shit happens. A lot of people. I'm lucky as fuck. I, I, hardly anything bad happens to me. And, and quite frankly, with the positive mindset that I have, really nothing bad happens to me. But it, I don't think life happens for me because nothing bad is happening. So what's that mean? Um, it's happening for me. No, and then this, when someone. And then when someone has something bad, like their freaking kid gets a terminal illness or something bad, well, you know, it's happening for you. I don't know if I buy that. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to 
vet that one out right here while I'm talking to you. Why, yeah. why do you think it happens so for us? I tell that to people because most people tend to see the negative or potential negative of a situation. Yeah, but let's say you got door kicked in and so your wife got So there's always killed. exceptions to every rule. In that situation, it's kind of hard to sit here right now in that hypothetical and tell you, hey, Brad, that's happening for me, brother. <laughs> Right? That's right. right. I'd probably want to go out and find that guy and cut his head off. Or, or you know, put him in jail. One of the two, right? So every Could situation it, obviously is going to be a little different. But what I found when I was in my cell with nothing, that every day trying to focus on the positive, trying to think about things that I was grateful for, completely changed my perspective on life. And I know a lot of people out here struggle with that. So one of the easiest ways is to start running everything through that filter, Maybe this is happening for me. What Maybe you, what I can happened, learn from this. What happened to your finger? Oh, I broke it. I broke this one. Same thing. Same thing. So what, I, what'd you do? Fighting. But not in prison? No, this was when I was 16 oh. and I'm knucklehead. Yeah. My What's I'm that, not. basketball or something? No, I caught a football. Really, Football, yeah. F- the pinky, hard you always football. get that on the pinkies. My dad's hands were all like that too. So, so... Would you agree that maybe that's not true? It doesn't happen for us. Like, like let's say you get diarrhea. I think the more let's say important you start, thing. Let's say, let's say you get a bad case of diarrhea or food poisoning. You know, well, it's happened for me. I think what I think what it means is try to find the positive in everything. Because if you said there is positive in everything, I would agree. Because, again, maybe you got diarrhea, which made you stay home or made you miss this, which means you could have gotten a crash on the way to work. Who knows? You ever see that commercial where the dude's mattered in hell? He gets a flat tire and then, you know, finally fixes the flat tire and then car breaks down. Car breaks down, then he gets on a bus and then the bus breaks down and all this shit happens to him the whole time. It's freaking bad day. So he gets home and uh, turns out somehow, you know, he's talking to God and God said, the reason why I did that, because if I didn't, if, if you if you'd have kept going, you would have smashed into this and that and this and that and ultimately would have ended up killing his you know, kid or something to where all those chain of events took place. So he'd be one second earlier and it was God, you know, doing those things to him where like that's life happening for you kind of thing. But in reality, I think it's just something good can come out of any situation. And I agree with that one. I don't yeah. know if, I don't know if life happens for you. Like you, you eat a bad piece of freaking fish and you get food poisoning I think that was just by chance. Like, you know, I don't think life did that to you. I don't think life gives a fuck about you. I think, I think we're all here and it's, it's us that needs to save us. Like you need to save you with this kind of thinking. And you did. Yeah. Well, I agree with what you're saying. I think it's a twist on words. What I found is most people, if they hear that statement, they feel empowered. It helps them because a lot of people, they struggle out there, man. They struggle because they don't believe in themselves and they see the worst case you know, scenario and everything that they come across. So I agree with what you're saying. I'm the type of person that no matter what happens to me, I'm going to find a way to, to use it to my advantage. Yeah. Now, is that life happening for me? Maybe. But what you're saying, I agree with as no, well. That's you, that's you making life happen. The yeah. way and you, you have to. You have to because we can't avoid adversity. You heard roll with the punches? Yeah. How about duck the motherfuckers? Duck them. I don't want to get hit. You don't need to get hit. You don't need to. Like, dude, if you can avoid it, trust me, avoid it. Yeah. But that's cool that you learned that positive because, dude, folks, if everybody out there watching this learns one thing today, whether or not the the cliche, you know, life happens for you was is technically – because, dude, by, I, I'm literal. I'll argue that if, if I think there's any, you know, air in it. And there, I think there's air. Now, again, I know a lot of people that say that rich people, powerful people, smart people. So there's something to it. Like you said, it does inspire people. People are like, oh, that makes sense. But I don't think it really holds water. What I think really holds water is, dude, your perspective makes a massive difference. You can sit there and feel sorry for yourself because you got food poisoning, or you can take you know a positive look that you got food poisoning. And, and, and for heaven forbid something happens to your wife or your child or anything like that. But if something did happen, life happens, you know, how do you handle it is, is the question. And, and that you can control. You can do it with positive, you know, responses and actions, or you can do it with negative and, and, you know, hurtful actions. And it's always best to look at the positive. Yeah. 100%. Now you're out doing the speaking tours. You got do TEDx speak. By the way, if anybody here listening wants this dude to speak at your event, where would they reach out to you? 
They could reach out to me at prisonofyourown.com. That's a, oh, that's a website too. Yeah. Because that's the name of your book, right? Yeah. Prison of Your Own. You wrote that book after you got out or while you were in? Yeah, I wrote it this past year when COVID started. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it, I just released it in January. How's it going? It's going well. Good, good. Yeah, I brought you a copy if you want one. Well, sure, as long as it's signed. Yeah. I, I, do, I do Audible more than I read books. I did the Audible in April. What's the rule with that? Like when you, because my book's just getting done and my team tells me, you got to wait 21 days after the hard covers out. I'm like, what? Well, I well, think that's, for, um, once you submit it, it takes 30 days for it to be cleared and released. I don't know if there's some time frame that you have to wait between the book release and the act and starting the audible. You could start it now. Yeah, you can start it, but it won't be available. Yeah. For 30 days. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to read my own uh, book as well. Did you? Yeah. Now what's the book about? Just basically what you learned in prison. It's about what happened to me before prison, how I had all these limiting beliefs and how I had this life I wanted to live, but I wasn't pursuing that life and being locked up in that cell. I was confronted by regret and facing a life sentence, everything just came together in that moment. And that's when I made the decision to change my life. And I talk about the things I did in prison to make that time productive and to make it the best years of my life at that point. And what I've been able to do since coming home using those same strategies. What if you ended up back in prison? You know, I have dreams about that sometimes. Every so often I'll have a dream that I did something years ago and it caught up with me. I have a wife and three kids now. And I'll have this moment where I'm going back to jail or something's happening. I know I'm not going to see them ever again. And I, I actually like those dreams because in that moment I wake up and I have tears in my eyes and it reminds me of how precious every moment is. Yeah. Am I overlooking something? Did I forget to say bye or give, you know, one of them a kiss? Am I not giving my all? Am I going through the motions? Am I not finding gratitude in what I get to do today? And they help me to remember. So every day I wake up and one of the first things I tell myself is second chance, second chance. Make this day count. Yep. That's the, that's what puts you in the right perspective. That's what gives you that gratitude. Exactly. Gratitude's key. I always use a million dollars cash. If I gave you a million dollars cash, would you be happy? People are like, yeah, I'd be excited. Well, what if I told you I'd give it to you, but you couldn't wake up? Well, of course I wouldn't take it then. So what you're saying is waking up, simply waking up is worth more than a million dollars. And when you think about it, shit's probably worth more than 10 million, 20 million dollars cash. Right now, like I would not take $20 million to know that this is my last day, would you? No, you wouldn't even take a billion. What right. are you going to do with it? Well, I mean, some idiot might say, I'll take a billion, give it to but my family. But that's a good way to get people to really like understand, oh, wow, you're right. Today is a precious gift it's I get. It's that valuable. It's yes. worth millions of dollars. And But then look at how you'd act if I gave you millions. You'd be so enthusiastic about life. You'd be, there'd be no pressure. You'd be just so happy. Now, we don't wake up that way, though. So that's what I try to tell people. Act like you're getting a million dollars cash every single morning because you're waking up and just that is worth the money. It doesn't matter if you're going to jail that day. It doesn't matter if your car's out for repo. It doesn't matter if your wife just cheated on you and you're, you know, losing your family because you're going through a divorce. It you might think it does, but that's the point. It doesn't if you just change your perspective. There's more than one way to look at anything. Yeah, absolutely. I use that with my son. He's 11 just to do little things. Maybe he doesn't want to clean his room. Maybe he doesn't want to go to his martial arts class that day. He's tired. And I ask him, hey, if I was going to give you a million dollars and I said, clean that room to the best of your ability, would you do it? And he'll look at me and smile and go, yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so why don't you do everything like that? Your life and the way you're living your life is worth more than a million dollars. And I tell that to him in that moment because you see how quick the switch is flipped. He goes from not wanting to do it, you know, maybe half-assing a little bit to thinking, no, I can do this way better. I'm capable. And it's just that quick little flip in your perspective that's so powerful. Yeah, that's the, that's the trick I found. How, how old are you? I'm 33. So you're a young buck still. You got, you got lots of time. So what's your goals, Sean? You want to be a public speaker permanently or do you want to turn that into something else? Yeah, I'd love to. I want to put on events. I want to travel and put on big events, um, you know, two, three-day events. I want to speak. I want to write more books. I want to continue coaching. I love doing that. You do coaching for people? Yeah, I do life coaching. That's So when I got out, I started, within two months, I left that job with my uncle. I found a, a spot in a gym in Santa Barbara that I could go and start training out of. That was my first step. I just needed a step in the door somewhere. 
And what happened is I got home and I'm going through my old contacts, trying to figure out what am I going to do? How am I going to get out of this trailer? And I reached out to an old friend who was doing personal training and he had a bunch of clients. He said, Hey man, you know, I know you were doing good when you were locked up. I want to give you a second chance or help you. Um, you can come down here and train with me as long as you get certified. So I got certified within two weeks. I had been reading all the, the stuff related to personal fitness, uh, exercise science, everything while I was away. So I took the test and all the, the quizzes and wrote the essays pretty easily. And then the week I was set to go out, there was wildfires that broke out in Southern California. And we were displaced. We had to leave. My uncle's property almost burned down. And then a couple of days later, rainstorms come through and just this downpour caused mudslides that shut down the roads, locked us in. The US 101 to Santa Barbara was completely covered and people actually lost their lives in that mudslide. It covered homes and killed people. So now I was stuck in Ventura County trying that, to figure- That happened for people. There you go, right? Well, no, you're I right. You're right. I think that shit just happened, but right. I, I just want, I thought it'd be funny now. Cause that's another good example. Yeah. I don't think that happened for anyone. I think you can find something good from it. Well, if you're one of the people that lost their family members or you still find something good from it, right? Like again, you could find positive out well, of tragedy. Even if the only thing you have is the memories that you shared with that person. And that's the only positive thing that you could think about. Are you live your life better? in remembrance of them, or you think, okay, my dad would have wanted me to rise above this. That's you finding the positive in it. Right? You, you, know, you, you know what I always say when people die? What? People die. Yeah. Like, you know, people think I'm heartless because I don't really cry when I find out people die. I go, whoa, really? Whoa. Now, again, no, no one real, real, real close to me, and I don't even want to put that in the universe. But when people die, I think to myself, people die. And people do die. You're going to die. I'm going to die. We're all going to die. The question is, is when? So when someone does, just remember that was supposed to happen. You know, hope, you know, regretfully, not this soon, but, you know, and then we're always sad for those people. Well, I think really we're sad for us because if you believe in any kind of spirituality whatsoever, isn't that person going to a better place? So what are you so sad about? Well, you're sad that you're going to miss them. Well, imagine if you died, let's say 20 years after this loved one died and you get up there and it's literally seconds that passed between your deaths. Think about that. Like seconds, like you die. And then 20 years later, you, you know, someone else dies and, and it, it feels like seconds and we're all up there. You know what I mean? Then, then death wouldn't bother you at all. Death wouldn't bother anybody at all if that were the case. Because you, know, you never know. Maybe up there, wherever we go next, has no time to where literally like, poof, you, you wake up, there's no illness, you're, you're, everything's great, and then poof, there's your family. You know, oh, you guys died too? No, I, I didn't die for another 40 years. Oh, shit, here you are. How you doing, buddy? And then there is no sadness. There is no doing without. If we knew this, wouldn't we, we, people die, we'd, we'd, we'd celebrate. It'd be like, it wouldn't affect us at all is what I'm saying. So what is that? It's a mindset, dude. It's a perspective. But we don't know. And that's why we get all sad. And that's how we react. And that's why we get depressed. And that's why we get angry. Because we don't know. So everything you're saying, dude, I agree with 100%. I think you got lucky to find it because a lot of people don't. You know what I mean? You get out, you're bitter, you're pissed off at the system, you know, and you're going to go freaking, you know, end up back in there. That's why a lot of yeah. people that come out of prison go back. The recidivism, is that what it's called? Yeah. The rate of recidivism for prisons is huge. So, again, if you're headed or in or listening to this podcast from, folks, I know so many people that got out of prison and, and, and now they're very successful. You heard of Ryan Stuman? Yeah. Go look his ass up. Yeah. He's been in prison. Like a lot of people have been in prison. And they get out and they're just fine and and shit works out. And you can use that freaking sentence to think. Like you said, gives you time to think, gives you time to figure shit out. You know what I mean? Now, what's next for you? If you get a bunch of calls from the bomb squad, people want you to come, you know, speak for their organization. They're going to go buy your book. Go buy your book at prisonofyourown.com, right? Yeah. And then so earlier you said visit shawmichaelcrane.com. 
So my website, it got hacked. It's not up right now. So okay. if, if someone wants to contact me about speaking, just reach out to me on Instagram, Sean underscore Michael underscore Crane. Shoot me a message. I want to be speaking. I want to share this message on stage. And I do life coaching with men. That's what I do full time right now. That's what I love doing. So I want to continue to, to grow my message, my awareness, and reach people that feel stuck, feel lost. They know that they're made for more, but there's a disconnect there. You know, they're not taking that action they want in their life. And that's what I do with the men I get to work with right now. Well, I can tell you this. There's people out there for sure guaranteed that feel that way. There's people that for some reason, whether it be life didn't do it for them or, or, or didn't smack them hard enough or, or, you know, parenting, like in my parents, I didn't really get beaver cleaver parenting. I'm 52 though. So like I'm an old dog. So it took me a long time to learn what you learned quick. So good thing that you learned and I'm glad you're giving back, but folks out there, you do feel stuck, man. I'm telling you, a couple of conversations from someone who's been there and you know felt the same way, how it goes goes a long way. At Sean underscore Michael underscore Crane, you'll find his ass. Uh, what about fitness? You obviously look fit. You teach any of that, or do yeah, you believe so, in it? Yeah. So no, when I came home, I was doing personal training. I realized that how, wasn't going to cut how it. How important do you think fitness is, though? Oh, it's it's one of the pillars, right? I, fitness is a major component of my life. That was one of the, the cornerstones of my transformation. It's building yourself up through daily action, seeing the change in your body, knowing I did that, taking care of yourself, eating the right food to be energized, have clarity. It's all intertwined. So it's fitness, it's mindset, it's daily actions, it's habits, your relationships, everything. So I, I work out every day. Fitness is a part of my life. I, I love to. I love to work out. I get that same endorphin rush I used to get when I would get high from my runs and my workouts. And that's what helped me to, to overcome my addiction is finding positive outlets to channel that energy into. What kind of diet you on? I just eat clean. I eat whole foods, you know, foods that you get at the grocery store that aren't in packages, that aren't, you know, sitting on a shelf for years at a time. So a lot of vegetables, fruits, good sources of protein. No fast food ever? Rarely. But if I do go out and eat fast food with the family once in a while... It doesn't even phase me. It's, you know, very f far in between. Um, because when you're, when you're living clean, you're not over consuming food and processed food, you know, here and there, your body, you can absorb that stuff and it doesn't phase you. No alcohol, no alcohol for no nine weed. years, nothing, no drugs, nothing, just clean living, maybe a nitro brew. And that's it, man. I do some caffeine. Is a nitro brew. Beer it's or no, it's that? caffeine. Oh, that's the only, that's my, that's my one. I guess not. Starbucks? I wouldn't, yeah, Starbucks. I'll do a nitro brew. Caffeine's the only thing I, I take in that's, you know, that's like a, a substance. I wouldn't call it a substance. Some people say it is, but I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I don't do anything. Not even tempted to. Not even tempted. What about so, your buddy? Say, come on, man. Let's go out and have a cocktail. I don't surround myself with people like that. So who you know? hang around matters. Yeah, my family. I got a couple great mentors. You know, I get to follow guys like you on social media that are leveling up that I can learn from. What I learned, you know, recently is, you know, the stuff that you're taking in all the time is so important. And I don't need you to mentor me like right here every day. I can learn from you from watching your YouTube channel, from watching you on Instagram or guys like Ed Milet. Ed so the Milet, more he says for you too. Yeah. I want to, I want to get him should, back on the podcast. You got to, you got to have that little debate. Cause I think I, you might've won in that one. Well, again, I think I did. I just can't remember what he said, but Ed's good. He's got all kinds of answers. He's probably heard it a lot. Right. So, but, but you know, he, he truly believes it too. And you know, he, th I think, I think I even can, I, what I, what happened. And if it didn't, I'm going to, I think I convinced him the same thing, which is, you know, it does give people inspiration to hear that that way, but it really means what, we borrowed it, borrowed, borrowed it down to, which is guys, how you look at things is what matters. You know, life, in my opinion, is going to happen. Shit's going to happen. It happens to everybody. There is nobody that had an amazing, beautiful, problem free life except for those who believe they have. Like the other day, someone asked me, What do you do when you get these problems? And I said, Dude, I don't really get a lot of problems. I mean, I don't get problems. Because I look at problems as opportunities. So when you tell me, well, what problems have you had? And I'm trying to think what problems. I can't think of any problems. Why? Because they're not really problems. They're opportunities. Like, for example, I can't find, you know, people to, to grow and scale my company. I can't find people. 
You know, everybody wants to sit home with, with, without a check. And, but see, I don't, I don't think that's a problem. First of all, I I think it's, it's uh, bullshit. First of all, there are people out there. They do want to work. Okay. You just haven't found them. Number one, that's an opportunity to find them. That's an opportunity to me. See what I'm saying? So what's the difference? Perspective. Some people would call that a problem. I don't think it's a problem. Same thing with that. I think opportunity is is what you're looking for if you want to be successful, right? Yeah. And I think opportunities, people mistake for risk. See, and most people avoid risk, which means they're avoiding opportunity. I look for opportunity, and it just happens to be risky sometimes, but risk doesn't scare me. No, and I think what you're saying is really important. So life is happening for me, not to me. That's the self-talk we have to entertain. Is that true? It's debatable, right? But if you have that self-talk, you're more likely to see the opportunity, right? You're more likely to feel empowered or see your next move versus feeling defeated. Yeah. So I think that's the difference. Is it, it true? And it makes you think. It makes you think. Now you're like, okay, what can I do with this situation? Yeah. Is there something here that could help me to improve somehow? Thinking. Thinking's the magic, dude. You, you, and you, when you're sitting in jail, you got time to think. That's one of the things that changed my life is having no distractions okay, and being me, able to think. Let me close it with this. What books would you recommend somebody read? What are the top three? Got to read these books. Well, Think and Grow Rich. I read that in prison. That's an all-time classic. That changed my life. Uh, the Go-Giver. That's another great one. Go-Giver. Yeah. Haven't heard of that one. And then, honestly, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale yeah. Carnegie. I mean, I love that book because it's so relevant to everyday life and then business and anything we're doing relationships yeah relationships new economy folks if i were you out of every book he gave i would get think and grow rich and how to win friends and influence people guaranteed 100 percent. i wouldn't read it once i'd read it multiple times make that you know thing wear out because if you can just master either one of those books you're done you're golden and then you can turn around and help other people like my man Shane or Sean. I was mixing Sean with Crane. Mm-hmm. Sean Crane, folks. Sean Michael Crane. Follow him. Sean underscore Michael underscore Crane. If this if this episode didn't really resonate with you because, man, you're just kicking ass, taking names, well, then share it out there because someone you know might need it. Until next time, keep it real. appreciate you coming in. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for having me, man. Dropping bombs with the real Bradley. Subscribe now.